Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell and I'm the senior minister. Welcome especially on this wonderful Mother's Day when we salute and celebrate the women who have been our spiritual mothers. Mother's Day began as a United Methodist project by United Methodist Women to celebrate those women who have impacted our lives and drawn us closer to Jesus Christ. We're so glad you're with us today. Because it is Mother's Day, we will not have youth tonight. But by next Wednesday night, all of our children and youth activities are all back up as we finish the final night of Logos. We have a wonderful mission we do in this church called the Sky's the Limit Graduation Party. It's for kids who are aging out of foster care to help them furnish and equip their first homes and apartments as they go out into the world. If you'd like to donate to that project, just make your check payable to UMW and be sure you put in the memo line, Graduation. It's an incredible ministry and you are welcome to be a part of it. As we think about the week ahead and what's coming up for summer, be sure you're marking on your calendar all of the church camps and vacation Bible schools. Uh, stay on your newsletter and you'll see the details for those events. But I want to remind you that the time is coming when camp registration will close, and so you do want to get registered. Contact Pastor John at the church office for more information on youth camps and contact Liliana Shell at the church office for information on children's camps. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you sound great. Thank you so much. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you've joined us in worship here on campus in our three services we have today or online. We're always glad you're worshiping with us. Uh, I like to always like to start off with a little bit of a teaching moment. And uh, today I want to draw your attention to this stained glass window. It's over here if you prefer to look that way. And you'll notice the symbols there. There's a book, of course, and that represents the Bible or God's Word. And then there are two symbols that come to us from Scripture. There's the sword, which out in the book of Hebrews, is the, God's Word is described as a sword, a powerful, powerful weapon. And then above that, you see a little light, and that comes from the Psalms. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And so God's Word is both a powerful, powerful thing, in our life and a light to our lives. And I think also that there are some amazing women who are very much like that as well. They're very powerful and strong and courageous and they're also a light on our journey. And today we celebrate them on this Mother's Day. Mother's Day was a Methodist project in the beginning. Methodist women started it and they had two goals in mind when they started Mother's Day. First was to recognize our spiritual mothers. So that may be our biological mother, maybe a stepmother, an adoptive mother, or a woman who's just filled that role in our life. And uh, to recognize those women and give thanks for their lives. And then the second goal was to call women to take action. They believe that women who love children 
would want to change the world and make it better for future generations. And we have this wonderful legacy that's been handed down to us now from those great women who first started Mother's Day. So to all the women who are here today and watching online, those of you who are biological mothers, adoptive mothers, stepmothers, all of you also who fill the role of powerful, courageous women in people's lives as teachers and counselors, youth group sponsors, children sponsors, VBS leaders, camp leaders, we say to you, happy Mother's Day. We're so glad to honor you today. And now, let us worship. Good morning, let's stand for the choral call to worship. call to worship. Now you're going to notice there's uh, exclamation points behind all these words, so we better say it with some excitement today, right? <laughs> let, the music, let the musicians make music. As we celebrate the victories of the Lord. The friends of God are like the light of the sun. Because the Lord brings them peace. Our hymn of praise is for the beauty of the earth. Information today is a Mother's Day litany. On this day of celebrating your love, God, we lift to you those who have given us life, those who have loved us, those who have blessed us, and those who have taught us, our mothers. May your blessing pour out upon the women who gave, gave us birth and those beautiful, strong women of faith who have been mothers to us along our journey. We praise you, O oh God, for your gift of motherly love, both gentle and fierce strong and humble, and both kind and true. We call forth your compassion upon every mother who has unknowingly caused pain and suffering. And so we lift to you our mothers, so imperfect, also so wounded by this world. We bless our mothers this day, no matter what they have done or left undone. We do this because we believe in your healing, and we believe in your love. And we believe that you love every mother. We stand together with all mothers, for we are all in need of your grace. We lift
lift to you the heart of every mother who has watched her child die of hunger, every mother who has been a victim of abuse, every woman who stands in protest against a world that massacres her children. O oh God, help, help each one, one of us, us to be your, your blessing, blessing of love. Of love. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks this day for the mothers in our life. Women who loved fiercely, courageously, and who risked it all for us. Some are mothers to us by biology. Some are mothers to us by marriage. Others have just taken that role in our life when we needed them so very, very much. Lord God, we thank you for each of these women. We pray your blessings upon them. This morning on the altar, the beautiful flowers remind us that some of us still have our mothers and that we should give them our time and our love. And others of us have lost our mothers to death and we should give them our great memories and our loving thoughts. We pray this morning that you be especially with mothers in this world who are struggling. Some are struggling because of the external forces around them, war, violence, and hunger. Some are struggling because of their immediate situation, their family, abusive men, systems that ignore them. We pray for all mothers who are weak and vulnerable, that you would raise up people who would love them, support them, protect them and enable them. We pray, O oh Lord, for those brave and courageous women around the world who step into roles and love children and those who are vulnerable. For school teachers and educators, for nurses and doctors, for volunteers in scout troops, sports teams, and especially, we say, for those women who step into those roles and volunteer in church, who are a mother to us in so many ways, but especially spiritually. We confess to you this morning in our sin that we don't always pay the respect or give the time to these precious people in our lives. Lord, simply help us to do better, to recognize the blessings in our midst, and to know that in each of these amazing women, you are revealing yourself through their love. These things we pray in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let's pass the peace, and if your mom's here, you better hug your mama. <laughs>my name is leslie cothran and i'm on the testimony hq team and honestly i'm not really sure why i agreed although i'm not shy and can talk and converse a lot two topics i don't feel comfortable talking about are politics and faith i just kind of think that both of those are personal things and people have their own opinions and thoughts and i don't feel knowledgeable enough to really discuss either one so i just avoid them or i don't bring it up at all also I grew up hearing testimonies from others. They all had a life-changing moment to point back to and base their faith around. They had a thing that made a really compelling story, a tragedy, an experience, a something, but I didn't. But what I've learned through getting outside my comfort zone and with the Testimony HQ experience is that that's a testimony in and of itself. My faith is my baseline, my true north, my calm in the storm around me. When stuff in life is happening that I don't understand, or it's hard, or I just don't like, I can refer back to that baseline of God that has always been there. While I don't necessarily believe that everything happens for a reason, I do believe that my faith helps me to learn something from everything that happens. My, help, my faith helps me to overthink a little less because I know that God's got a plan and I just need to trust Him. For me, this relationship with God can come through conversations with God in the car, or on a walk, or when I'm restless at 2 a.m., or maybe walking the labyrinth. Just being somewhere quiet where I can center and just listen helps me be a little calmer in the chaotic world. My testimony is walking with God daily and learning to communicate, and not just through talking, which I mentioned I'm really good at, but also making sure I listen. Well, I'm working on it anyway. for the offering. God of great gifts, we give you these gifts today knowing that you are the father of gifts. You mother us, constantly providing for us, caring for us. As we have been abundantly provided for, so we give abundantly to the work that you give us to do, the work of the church, to care for those who are poor. Accept these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture today is Exodus 2, 1 through 4. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, and she plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Of all the things it takes to be a mother, I think courage may be the most important thing of all. And one of the bravest mothers I've ever known was only 15 years old when I met her, and she already had a child. Her name was Cindy, and Cindy was an ark builder. I know you probably don't know what that means, but don't worry. I'm going to explain it. Cindy attended another United Methodist Church, and her pastor was a friend of mine. And he called me one day and said, I have this young lady in my church. She's 15, and she has a child. I know you were a family counselor before you became a pastor. Do you think she could come over occasionally and talk to you? And I said, yes, of course. So Cindy would come over every few weeks to where I was serving as a pastor. The secretary would give her a Coke, calm her down, sit with her a few moments, and then she would come in and we would talk about her situation. She was an incredibly brave young lady raising this little baby basically on her own. Her mother tried to help, but her mother was emotionally unable to provide much. Her father pretended the child had never been born. Her family situation was very, very bad. But she was trying to make the best of it. Every Sunday, if you can imagine this, she wasn't even old enough to drive. She got herself up, got her and her child dressed, and someone from church would pick her up, and every Sunday she went to church with her baby, all on her own, no one else in her family went. She was a very special young lady. She would come into my office, and she was always a bit nervous at first, unsure what to expect. 
And so uh, some of the people online watching have known me for decades. And they know that in, in, in my office, most of my ministry, I always had a, a big giant painting of the ark. With, and it wasn't just any time. It's the exact painting that Kevin found for us. And, and it's not just at any time. It's, it's, it's the ark preparing to, to take the animals on board and, and the families and protect them and save them. And so Cindy would come and, and she would sit in my office and always place herself where she could see that painting. Somehow it gave her comfort. And maybe she got the idea that I was trying to express by hanging it in my office, that the church is, is like an ark, holding us and protecting us. One day we were talking about her situation, and she'd been trying to decide whether she could raise this child alone or if she should give the child up for adoption. And I said, Cindy, what do you really want to do? Not, not what does everybody else want you to do, but what do you want to do? And she said, Pastor Robert, I want to keep my baby. And I said, and what's keeping you from committing to that? And she said, well, I'm afraid of my family. I'm afraid of the influence they'll have on my baby. And I'm just thinking that maybe if, if my baby could be placed with a, a Christian family, my baby would, would get a lot better influences in his life than my family could ever provide. And I thought about it in a moment and said, Cindy, you go to church every week, don't you? Yes, Pastor, I do. And I said, and, and, and you love your church. Yes, Pastor, I do. Has your church been good to you? Oh, Pastor, they've been so good. They love me, they take care of me, they encourage me, they affirm me. The UMW ladies gave me a shower when, uh, when my baby was born. My own family, nobody ever gave me a shower. I, I didn't have anything. But the church has provided everything I needed. I said, Cindy, I wonder if there's a way that you could surround yourself with loving, supporting, affirming people who would provide the kind of influence you're so wisely seeking for your baby. The kind of people that would, would help you have a safe place spiritually and emotionally. That would be there for you in the storm and, and take care of you. She said, Pastor, are you saying I should have something like an ark? Isn't that a beautiful image? Here was this young lady, vulnerable and mistreated, trying to raise an infant in the world. And her image of what might happen in her life was the image of an ark where she and her child would be surrounded and protected by love, where their vulnerability would not be exploited, but protected, where she would not be condemned for things that had happened in her life, but where she would be affirmed because of who she was growing in to be as an incredible woman of faith. I think that we're looking for art builders in this world. Cindy was an ark builder. She made the decision to raise that child and to invite other people into her life. At 15, she found women in the church, sometimes who were in their 80s, and had long since finished raising their children to be that ark that surrounded her and her baby in love. Now, a lot of people think that there's only one ark story in the Bible, the one with the big boat, and the only ark builder in the scripture is a man named Noah, but that's not right. There's actually another ark story in the Bible. And in this ark story, the, the builder of the ark is a woman. And her name is Jochebed. A lot of different ways to say that. Even among Hebrew speakers, they pronounce it different ways. Jochebed means God is glory. Now, when you hear that beautiful name, you think that she might have been someone of power and strength and wealth, but she was not. She was a slave 
born to a slave, living in a slave's family. And in this story of building arcs, she and an Egyptian princess and a sister and some very brave women are going to come together to stand up against the political forces of their day. And I'll just let that rest on your heart however it needs to. But these women refuse to become victims of the circumstances of their world. And that is especially true for Jochebed, a slave. She is among the most powerless people on the planet at that time when Egypt was a ruling empire of the world. A slave born in that country. She was married off to a close relative, as was the Egyptian custom, a man named Levi. Together they would start a tribe, a great tribe, that exists even to this day in Judaism. The keepers of the temple and the sacred scrolls, the Levites. But none of that was apparent at the time. She was simply a slave. And the circumstances around her were terrifying. You may remember your Old Testament just enough to know that that Joseph rose up in the Egyptian hierarchy. Joseph, who was a Hebrew, and, and was loved by the Pharaoh and helped the Pharaoh out of a lot of different situations. And so Joseph invited his people, the Hebrew people, to come and live in Egypt. But that Pharaoh died. And a new Pharaoh rose up. And he looked at these Hebrew people and he was terrified of them because they were many, as the scripture says, and he thought thought they might overcome his people. And so he ordered that they be put into hard labor as slaves, thinking we'll work them so hard a lot of them will die off and we'll control the population that way. But they weren't successful. And so then he called in the Hebrew midwives, These were very special women that helped deliver children as they were being born. By tradition, they were themselves childless. Well, they could have felt as if they were something less because of that, especially in this culture. They instead took on an incredible giving servant role of bringing children into the world. And so the Pharaoh called them in and he said, here's what I need you to do. Every time you're called out to deliver a little Hebrew baby, if it's a boy, I want you to kill him. And if it's a girl, you can let her live. But I don't want these these Hebrews growing up to have an army to fight against me someday. So you midwives, I'll be watching you. I'll be checking on you. Make sure all the boys die. And after a while, none of the boys were dying. And so the Pharaoh called these midwives in who were quiet slave women. The scripture says something interesting. The scripture says they loved God. So they would not murder the little boy babies. And the Pharaoh said, what's going on here? I gave you an order. I am the ruler of the world. I am the son of the sun itself. And the Hebrew midwives did this, have this funny little bit where they're standing there in front of Pharaoh, their lives on the line, they go, Eh, I don't know. You know these Hebrew women? They're so strong. They're out there making bricks and stuff in the hot sun, and they have a baby, and two seconds later, they're back up making bricks again. It's just, they're amazing. We can't get there in time. And so then the Pharaoh is flummoxed, and he gives the order. Then take every single male baby born to the Hebrews and throw them into the Nile. Let the crocodiles get them. Which brings us to Jacob. She gave birth to a little boy named Moshe, as we say in English, Moses, who will become the central figure of the Old Testament story of the Exodus. For three months, she kept little Moshe hidden. It's it's a little bit easier to do that with a newborn. She kept that baby hidden. And it says in the scripture that when she looked at him, she saw that he, and I love, this is a, a translation of the Hebrew, only a baby boomer like me could give, right? 
It says, she looked at the baby and he was fine. <laughs> if you're of a certain vintage, you know what that word fine means. When we were guys in high school and a pretty girl would walk in, we'd say, she's fine. That's that deal, right? That's not quite a great translation of the word. The word there in Hebrew is tov, which means beautiful and full of life. It has a lot of meanings, but that, that's a good summary, beautiful and full of life. And it's a word you'll recognize. Because when you go back to the creation story, every time God creates something, he says it is good, right? Which is the word tov. Every time God creates something, he looks at it and he sees it, and he says it's beautiful and full of life. It's tov. My mother ran a college dorm for almost 40 years. She loved every kid in the dorm most of the time. Right? And she taught me that every person is tov. Every child to God is tov. Beautiful. Beautiful. And full of life. Jehochebed looked at this little baby, Moses, and he was beautiful and full of life, and she could not kill him. So for three months, she protected him, and then he started to be too noisy to hide. And so she goes out and she builds an ark. That's what the word literally is in Hebrew. It's not the big giant ark you put animals in. Ark just means a container. She builds this little basket thing out of papyrus, which is the, the reeds down in the Nile. She covers it with pitch and bitumen, which if you are kind of remembering Bible stories, that's exactly the description that's used about the big ark with all the animals and how it's made. She, she takes her infant son and she puts him in that little basket. And here's where she is so brave, this ark builder. She goes down to the water of the Nile. I've been to the Nile. I wouldn't swim in it for anything. It's full of crocodiles and bad stuff. But she takes that little baby in that little ark and she pushes him out into the Nile. Crying out to God silently in her heart that God will save her child. Now, if you've been a parent, you've prayed that prayer. You've prayed that prayer if you've been a parent or a grandparent, if you've had that role in someone's life, there comes a moment when you can't do anything anymore for them. There's not anybody you can call or not any letters you can write. You have to pray to God for help. And here, what happens in this story? Pharaoh's daughter, now she was one of many daughters, she comes down to the Nile it says to bathe. This is not to take a bath. It's not what we're talking about. Nobody did that in the Nile. But she was a part of the royal family. The royal family were, were, were descendants of the sun god. And, and the sun god was married to the god of the river. The river Nile was everything in their culture. And so they would come down and take a ritual bath there in the water in order to be connected with the god of the river who was married to the sun god. And so she comes down as a part of her religion to take a ritual bath there. She's got this whole entourage because they've got to make sure there's no crocodiles around. They've got to make sure there's no regular people around looking at the princess, getting in the water, those kind of things. And they're all out there, and they notice this basket. And she commands that it be brought to her. And immediately she knows what it is, this princess she knows her daddy's law is to kill this baby. And to obey her father's law, she should have ordered the child put to death immediately. But the, the text, the Old Testament text in its Hebrew says, the child was lamenting. I don't know if you've ever heard a child lament. But think of a child in great pain and great hurt. There is a cry there that will split open walls. And baby Moshi is lamenting. And this Egyptian princess has to make a decision. What do I do? Do I obey my father, gain his favor? After all, he's got all kinds of little princesses running around. Or do I defy him? And probably suffer the same fate 
as these Hebrew children. And the scripture says her heart was touched with compassion. Every woman I've ever noticed in the church who gives their life in service, you can describe that way. She's had her heart touched with compassion. She's heard the cry of the weak and the vulnerable, those who cannot survive without help. She sees the beautiful little ark. She knows that someone who loves this child has made that for this child. Her heart is touched, and she makes the decision to defy the emperor of the world, her father, and to save this child. God, give us more women and people who don't worry about the politics, but focus on the person. God, give us more people who don't care about the politics, but focus on the person. Okay, I'm going to keep saying it till you say amen. Right? It's amazing when you think about it. This woman who is not the biological mother of this child will take this child to raise as her own, courageously standing up against the politics and the powers of her day, the institutions of her day, the structures of her day, because she's brave. And she's an art builder too. And wouldn't you know it, just at that moment, Moses' older sister, Miriam, has been hiding in the bushes and just pops out and says, oh, your majesty, I just happened over here that you found this Hebrew baby. Would you like me to go get a nursemaid for this child for you? Yes, says the princess. Go and fetch me a Hebrew woman to nurse this child. And Moses is reunited with his nursemaid, his mother, Jochebed. Right. Amazing, isn't it? God brings these powerful, courageous women who are willing to risk everything all together in this moment. The midwives, Jehochebed, Miriam, the Egyptian princess, they're all ark builders. They refuse to give in to the powers and the institutions that crush and destroy vulnerable and weak lives. What about you? Would you do that? I mean, ask yourself, be honest with yourself. Are you willing to risk it? Think about the women in your life who've had powerful roles, who've helped you grow up spiritually. Think about what they gave up to do that in your life. There's this powerful moment in this story where this weak and vulnerable child's life is at risk because of just stuff. The power and the politics and the force of its day, the institutions of keeping the empire alive is more important than any individual, of course. God help us if we live in that kind of world, right? Where the weak and the vulnerable are crushed because the institution must go on. God, raise up brave, courageous art builders who refuse to give in to the power and the politics of the world and who focus their lives on the people. I think about that young mother in my office so long ago saying, Pastor, I need an ark. I need a place where, where my baby and I were, were protected and loved and surrounded by care and support, where we can weather the storms of the world and be delivered on the other side safely. And nothing's changed. It's still that kind of a world where the weak and the vulnerable cry out in hurt and pain, some of the victims of war, some of the victims of hunger, some of the victors of power right here in our own communities. And God still calls the art builders to rise up and be the mothers of generations. 
Today, you can walk in just about any synagogue in the world and find someone named Cohen, which is the modern name for Levi. Jehochebed's children covered the globe because of her courage. And I am so grateful to have known Cindy. Eventually, the bishop and his wisdom moved me, and I went to a new church, and I became her pastor. And I was able to baptize her child and perform her wedding when she married a cowboy from southwest Oklahoma. And I stay in touch with her. She lives on a farm in this part of the state with her husband, her firstborn, and the two that came afterward. She's still a loving and faithful member of the church. And she now is an art builder, too, for others. This is the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, I want you to know that God sees you as Tov, as someone who is beautifully made and full of life. And you can respond to God's love in so many different ways. But in particular today, we invite you to be baptized. If you've never been baptized, that's a kind of birth of entering into the love of God. We invite you to come and join the church. Become a part of this ark so that we can protect and save the vulnerable and those who are in need and be a home and be friends to those who need a friend. We invite you to come with any need you have that we might pray for you. But don't miss the call of God today in your life. Be an art builder. Will you come as we stand and sing? Thank you again for being here. Take this opportunity today to call someone, visit someone, and say thank you for the mother role they played in your life. Uh, No youth tonight. We want our young people to be with their families. We kick everything back up on Wednesday night for Logos, and we look forward to seeing you there. We join me now in the sending forth. Be strong and be courageous. For the Lord our God is with us.